answer your question, butterflies are modified moths. Well, now hold on just a minute. Here's what happens with your raw rat run. You go on to 50 different topics and use all these big words, and it's real nice to have a pause button so that people can understand. This is what professors do to their students all day long. The students can frantically take notes and keep up. They don't have time to ask any questions. And by the time they're ready to ask a question, they're on to 40 more topics. So m butterflies are modified moths. Well, let's talk about that just for a minute. Let's see, Bill, good to have you here, Jim. Let's see, Alt-DV, I think I got it. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> to answer your question, you said butterflies are modified moths. No, Mr. Nelson, they are not. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. <clears throat> the most obvious difference is in the feelers on a mutter butterfly and a moth, the antenna. Most butterflies have thin, slender filaments, antenna, which are club-shaped at the end. Moths, on the other hand, have a comb-like or feathery antenna. Um, let's see, I'll show you. Here is, this is a moth, this is a butterfly, okay? Their antenna are very different. Butterflies are not modified moths. Each one works amazingly well for all sorts of their sensory systems. How would it work in the meantime while it's transitioning from one to the other? Being modified moths means that the ancestors of butterflies would have started with the moth structure, assuming that moths already had that feature by then, because we are talking about a very early split in the family. And then early butterflies simply lost fronds on the way down to the remaining cluster at the end, streamlining their current configuration without any loss of function. And this could have happened in whole or in part, even before there was much specialization at all in their antennae. If it works fine as is, why would it change? Did it improve? How could you study biology at the University of Texas and not know this? What is it that you imagine that I don't know? Since I did formally study zoology, biology, cladistics, and evolution, then I do know this, and will be happy to explain it to you since you're the one who obviously doesn't understand any of it. Natural selection was only the first working mechanism ever proposed for evolution, but it isn't the only one. We know of a few of them now. Genetic drift, for example, is much more significant. This is an important lesson, so I'll recap this later on because it bears repeating, but to explain, mutations are much more frequent than you may imagine. For example, the molecular clock measures significant mutation rates, which vary depending on whether they're genomic or mitochondrial, and those are just the mutations that count for significant effect. Mutations don't work like they do in movies and comic books, where one mutation causes a whole suite of changes. It usually takes quite a few mutations to see any appreciable difference at all. A natural selection is a process of population genetics and only acts on those mutations that have an impact on performance or reproduction. Deleterious mutations tend to be eliminated from the gene pool very quickly, if not immediately. Beneficial mutations have a preferential advantage, but even with that, it could still take generations to see those changes spread throughout the population. There are many more mutations that are insignificant and neutral. Now, according to this study, Humans average 128 mutations per zygote. That's just the ones that every one of us has to start with right from the point of conception because each cell has the potential for further mutation every time it undergoes mitosis. But those are somatic. Evolution is driven only by heritable mutations, being those that are passed down through the gamete cells, which are then replicated from the first division of the zygote and continuing throughout the development of the organism. So every pair of fraternal siblings already has an average of 256 mutation differences between them. Now, these are cumulative, but they can't build up exponentially because the parent gene pool has a tendency to restrict the degree of variance that can occur within the population. So those new and novel mutations will be effectively suppressed in the next generation, just as a matter of population mechanics, because of the recombination with other sexual partners. The norm usually overrides the aberration. But genetic isolation of relatively small groups now outside the influence of the dominant gene pool relaxes that restriction, allowing more mutations to accumulate with greater frequency. And these changes quickly build up to distinguish out groups from their ancestral or sister groups. So that in just a few generations, you'd be able to recognize which group some individual belongs to. And this is without any requirement of improvement. There are a number of familiar examples that I'll go over in the recap later on. For the moment, remember that evolution isn't just about getting bigger and better all the time. It's a theory of biodiversity, meaning an ever-widening variety of increasingly different lineages. So to anthropomorphize this a bit, nature experiments with every generation going in every direction at once. This is how it is and why I say that evolution is usually a matter of incremental, usually subtle changes in physical or chemical proportion, not in one direction, 
but where every sibling could start a different direction, bigger or smaller, faster or tougher, with any body part being a different length and or shape and running the spectrum of red and green, whatever. If those initially tiny changes don't have any significant impact or on survival or procreation, then natural selection will not apply, and they're free to diverge into myriad varieties, such as the hundreds of thousands of Lepidopterans, for example, with the different types of antennae seen on butterflies, skippers, and moths. Butterflies and moths are not the same, okay? There are lots of differences. Basset hounds and dachshunds are not the same. What's your point? Neither one of them is the same as a wolf, either. No one would ever look at a wolf in the wild and say, that's a basset hound. Even you could tell the difference between a wolf and a basset hound, can't you? I bet you could tell the difference between a basset hound and a dachshund, too. If you can tell the difference, then they're not the same. They're a different breed, or maybe even a different species. But that's the point, isn't it? Biodiversity, the diversification of one kind of animal evolving into different kinds of whatever the parent category was, and the older the category is, the bigger it is, meaning the more it is diversified, the more grandchildren and great-grandchildren it has. Remember, we're talking about species here. And that also means that if butterflies evolve from moths, which we know they did, then of course you'd be able to tell the difference, just like you can with wolves and hounds, even though you know they're still related. Other taxonomic schemes have been proposed, but none of them is perfect. Both taxonomists and amateurs make use of the obvious difference between butterflies and moths. Go type in Google, it's G-O-O-G-L-E, and, and enter in the little line there, it says, what's the difference between butterflies and moths? There are many, many differences. They are not related. They look similar because the same guy designed them. His name is God, okay? Oh, really? I didn't know you knew so much about Lepidopteran classification. Oh, yeah, I, that's right, I forgot. You don't know Jack about squat. That's why you attribute everything to your magic imaginary friend. You accept that your dream of genie did not create each individual species of butterfly. You allow that they evolve from a common ancestor. But it turns out that moths and butterflies both come from the same common ancestor through the same evolutionary process, and that butterflies are a specialized subset of what we otherwise commonly recognize as moths. And following your advice, Everything I look up on Google Scholar says that butterflies are related to moths by absolutely every taxonomic system ever devised. For example, in a classification of the Lepidoptera and related groups with some remarks on taxonomy, we read that Amphispinoptera is an insect superorder composed of two sister orders, Lepidoptera, that's butterflies and moths, and Trichoptera, that's caddisflies. Trichoptera and Lepidoptera share a number of derived characters, synapomorphies, which demonstrate their common descent. And since you don't understand big words, I'll translate it for you. Derived synapomorphies are characteristic traits that are shared by both parent and daughter clades and that were evidently inherited from a common ancestor. Those shared inherited traits are that females rather than males are heterogametic, meaning that their sex chromosomes differ. A dense setae are present in their wings, which are further modified into scales in Lepidoptera, so you see where that came from. And then there's a particular veneration pattern in the forewings, that's the double-looped anal veins, and the larvae have mouse structures and glands to make and manipulate silk. These are traits that butterflies, moths, and caddisflies all have in common that they evidently inherited from a shared evolutionary origin. We're not interested in superficial surface structures because we know that classifying things by outward appearances is inaccurate and lazy. If we try to classify things by differences, we'll soon isolate every man apart from all other men. So we look at core commonalities instead with much the opposite result and a better understanding. <clears throat> wing coupling mechanisms. Moths have a system to couple their rear wing to their front wing. Remember we talked about that when we talked about some of the insects. They have a special system that couples the wings together. Butterflies don't have that. <clears throat> the hind wing can be coupled to the front wing. Special little clips or reticulum and a little frenulum that clips in there to hold the wings together to add stability. Butterflies don't have that. How, how long would it take for that to evolve? And if it did change from a moth to a butterfly, that's losing something, not gaining something. Evolution doesn't require that we always gain something. Birds, for example, lost their dinosaur fingers and their dinosaur tails. Humans lost most of our hair and half of our musculature, and some of our genome still carries defective monkey genes, genes that work in monkeys but are broken in us, and positive benefits have been identified coming from that. Things can evolve to be bigger or smaller, or have more or less, loaded with extras or stripped down for efficiency. 
and sometimes eliminating unnecessary encumbrance is better. That's still evolution, even if it appears to you to be a loss of whatever you consider information. Okay. Uh, you know, the Grand Marquis looks similar to the Chevy Caprice. They're not the same. The Corvette and Corvair don't look much alike at all because they are different. But then again, they're both still Chevys. The pupa, the way that they go into the chrysalis stage or into the, uh, when they go through metamorphosis, most moths, moth caterpillars spin a cocoon made of silk when they go into the pupa stage. Most butterflies, on the other hand, form an exposed pupa called a chrysalis. So the <clears throat> butterfly forms a chrysalis which is hard. There's the butterfly forming a chrysalis. The moths form a cocoon. They're not the same, Mr. Nelson, okay? And you can't, for you to just glibly say butterflies are modified moths, that's the kind of stuff students have to hear all day long, and it's just not true. You don't know your moth and butterfly anatomy. Maybe not. So let's check with those who do nothing but study moth and butterfly anatomy and see what they have to say about this. Let's look at some more peer-reviewed studies. This one, for example, notes that since 1991, butterflies, in a broad sense, including the Hadeloidea, are subordinate in a large clade comprising also three or four other clades that are moths, meaning that butterflies are nested within a clade of moths. And once again, I'll help you with the technical jargon. These experts in moth and butterfly anatomy are literally saying that butterflies are modified moths. That is exactly what this means. Color of the wings is different. Butterflies have extremely, oh here, most butterflies have bright colors on their wings. Nocturnal moths, on the other hand, are usually plain brown, gray, white, or black, and often with an obscuring pattern. Zigzags, or swirls, will help camouflage them as they fly during the day. So here is a butterfly, okay? Greek butterfly. Some butterfly wings are clear. They can see through them. That's pretty cool. So those butterflies are different, aren't they? Yeah, they're not the same. So what makes it a butterfly if it's different? Yeah, okay. Butterflies have beautiful bright colored wings. The monarch butterfly and the crystal uh, goes through the stages there. And butter, you can study butterflies. They are not the same as moths. And for you to just glibly say that is silly. It's not me saying it. It's everyone who knows better than you. This time let's look at Lepidoptera phylogenia systematics, the state of inventorying moth and butterfly diversity, which says that the monophyly of the order Lepidoptera is firmly established by an impressive suite of synapomorphies of its constituent basal lineages. And once again, I'll dumb this down so much that maybe even you can understand it. That means that butterflies and moths are the same kind, and that those who really do understand moth and butterfly anatomy better than you ever will determined that they are the same kind through a suite of evidently evolved common traits, which I'll show you in a moment. Here's a chart to help you understand that a synapomorphy is a morphological trait that is shared by both parent and daughter clades. This article also talks about autopomorphies, which are morphological character traits uniquely indicative of a particular daughter group. That's what each of the differences are that you tried to use to separate butterflies from moths. Each of those differences is an evolutionary autopomorphy indicative of that clade. Those differences distinguish butterflies as a unique group among Lepidopterans, but Lepidoptera itself is identified by the core similarities that butterflies share with moths and that make them the same. It also says that the position of the group within the insect hierarchy is similarly well established. And what they're saying here is that they know that this chart is reasonably accurate, that you can use this to follow the evolution of these insects down to the crown or beginning of the family that includes both butterflies and moths. And note that the sister clade of Lepidoptera is Trichoptera, which is important because the next thing the article says is that it is strongly supported sister group relationship to the Trichoptera, caddisflies, constituting with the latter a high rank taxon, Amphiospinoptera, which means that moths and butterflies and caddisflies are all the same kind too. If we look up learnaboutbutterflies.com, we read that caddisflies are the ancient ancestors of butterflies and moths. Their larvae are aquatic and live in portable cases constructed from sand grains or fragments of stems bonded to a silk tube surrounding the body. And that modern day bagworm moths, psychidae, still have larvae that lives inside cases. Now, this was written for children and is necessarily dumbed down to the point of absurdity, just like you. It's more accurate to say that caddisflies are karyotypic of transitional species, being the living representatives of the lineage from which butterflies and moths have evolved. 
Of course, we have fossil evidence of that too. This study says the diverse scales confirm a late Triassic radiation of Lepidopteran lineages, including the divergence of the Glossata, the clade that comprises the vast multitude of extant moths and butterflies that have a sucking proboscis. But it wouldn't be a proper phylogeny unless phylogenomics provides strong evidence of relationships of butterflies and moths. In this study, the scientists report that they generated a molecular data set with 46 taxa combining 33 new transcriptomes with 13 available genomes, transcriptomes, and expressed sequence tags using HAMSTER, which is a program for searching and matching genetic sequences, with a Lepidoptera-specific core ortholog set to single copy loci. We identified 2,696 genes for inclusion into the phylogenomic analysis. Nucleotides and amino acids of the all-gene, all-taxon dataset yielded nearly identical, well-supported trees. Monophyly of butterflies, Papionidae, was strongly supported, and the group included skippers, Hesperiidae, and the enigmatic butterfly moths, Hadylidae. Butterflies were placed as sister to the remaining Obtectomerian Lepidoptera, and the latter was grouped with greater than or equal to 87% bootstrap support. Now, rather than translate all those big words for you, they drew you a picture. Look at all the beautiful, colorful wings on those moths. And then you have one subset emerging from within that group that became the very specialized subset that we call butterflies. Because it's not enough to have morphology, embryology, transitional species, and fossils, whenever possible, we have to have the final proof in the genome to close the case conclusively. And you want me to believe this evolved by chance from an explosion of nothing. At the end, you're going to say, we don't believe they came from nothing. Well, then you don't believe your science textbooks, because they all teach we came from nothing. I've already explained that regardless what your oversimplified high school textbook says, the universe did not come from nothing. But even if it did, butterflies still came from moths, which came from something like modern caddisflies and so on, not nothing. Evolution does not depend on nor even relate to however the universe began. That doesn't matter, and I personally don't care how the universe came together, but I don't believe it came from nothing regardless what your textbook says. He said nearly, there are nearly a quarter million Lepidopterans, that would be the moth and butterfly family, but less than 50,000 of them are butterflies. Now, every little tiny word I say, you stop and pick at it, nearly a quarter of a million. Moths and butterflies constitute with nearly 160,000. I believe that's way less than a quarter million. And you said there are 50,000 of them are butterflies. Let's see, this one says 17,000 are butterflies, but hey, that's close to 50,000. You could work for the government, okay? One of the articles I cited earlier talked about John B. Hepner's 1991 estimate that there should be a total of 255,000 extant Lepidopterans in the wild. This article by Niels Christensen et al. in 2007 disagrees, saying that while currently there are about 160,000 described species of Lepidoptera, the total number of extant species is estimated to be around a half a million. He says this based on the rate of hundreds of previously unknown species being described every year. But you're right, I should work for the government so that maybe they'd stop denying science and rejecting everything their scientists report to make believe fantasy nonsense at everyone's expense like you do. The moth template. Now what on earth is a template? All of them follow the moth template. Well, let's see. I thought I'd check that out. Uh, let's see. A template. A shaped piece of metal, wood, card, plastic, or other material used as a pattern for processes such as painting, cutting out, shaping, or drilling. Most of you that have done any construction at all know what a template is. Doesn't it usually indicate that the guy, somebody designs a template and then follows that pattern? Well, the Bible says God created the heaven and the earth. The Lord created the heavens. He said, I am the Lord and there is none else, Isaiah 45. In those days <clears throat> shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created. He's claiming pretty clearly that he did it, Mr. Nelson. Okay, I know you don't like that, but the Bible certainly claims he did it. I know you don't believe the Bible yet. There is no way that I could believe the Bible short of suffering substantial brain damage, which listening to you can cause. But until then... I still have to point out that God didn't say anything there. Those were the words of superstitious primitives who wrote the Bible, making unsupported assertions about a magic imaginary being they made up in their ignorance. If God existed, he wouldn't have written the Bible, but if he had written the Bible, then it wouldn't be attributed to dozens of anonymous human authors, some of whom erroneously and some of whom never even existed. 
Nor would it waste so much time on irrelevant fables about things that never happened while also promoting animal cruelty, incest, slavery, abuse of slaves, spousal abuse, child abuse, child molestation, abortion, pillage, murder, cannibalism, genocide, and prejudice against race, nationality, religion, sex, and sexual orientation. If God had written the Bible, then he would have given us an accurate description of our origins and the nature of the earth in relation to the rest of the cosmos, rather than describing the earth as a flat disk under a giant crystal dome. And he would have included a primer, giving us a numeric system complete with a zero, as well as an explanation of the periodic table and a warning about infectious microbes. That's the least we could expect for any God worthy of worship, anyway. But the reason your God didn't say anything in the Bible is because he didn't write the Bible, because he never wrote or did anything because he doesn't exist. Does the moth even know he has those spots on his wings? Does he know they happen to look like an owl, which terrifies just about every other bird in the world? They're pretty near all terrified of the owls. Does the, mo does the moth know? Did he make them show up there? Why aren't they square or triangle shaped? Why round? No reason, literally. No reason. As explained before, with no less than 160,000 different species catalogs so far, most moth wings actually do have straight lines or curved lines on them, which offer no advantage at all. Having, as you showed yourself, what looks like letters or numbers to us offers no benefit whatsoever to the moth or anyone else. But then, out of tens of thousands of random samples, you accidentally blindly happen upon the one pattern that actually does offer a benefit to the moth because it frightens predators away? then you have a trait that natural selection can favor. Well, chromosomes are pretty tiny. Here's a grain of salt compared to the eye of a needle, okay? Salt grains are pretty tiny. It takes three of them to equal about a millimeter. There's a grain of salt on a penny, okay? The human hair is about 0 0.06 millimeters across. Blonde hair, red hair, and brown hair are different sizes. Average blonde has about 100,000 hairs on their head. Average brunette has about 80,000. An average redhead has 60,000. And who cares? I just lost interest. So here's a normal hair, about 0.06 millimeters. A pencil, it would take about 100 hairs side by side to equal the width of a pencil. Okay. DNA molecules or chromosomes, one of the, probably the most complicated molecule in the world. I don't, I'm not aware of any that are more complicated than that. DNA molecule is two nanometers in diameter. Real tiny, okay? Real small. One millimeter is a, is a million nanometers. So let's see, a DNA molecule is two nanometers across. A millimeter is a million nanometers. 500,000 DNA strands would be one millimeter wide. Pretty tiny. And this is an unbelievably complex information. It would take eight and a third million DNA molecules to fit in a line across a normal human hair. The stump of one of your hairs would take eight and a third million DNA strands side by side laid out to be as wide as, as a hair. I don't think it's um, logical to say the DNA strands, the chromosomes, have, it could have happened by chance. Your argument from incredulity fallacy has no validity here. What you are in effect asking us to do is to teach what is not evidently true. We can't pretend that there's a magic invisible man behind everything because there is no evidence to indicate that that is even possible, much less probable. It is dishonest to assert empty, baseless speculation as though it were fact, yet that's what all religions do, and that's another reason that faith is the most dishonest position it is possible to have. What we can teach is that anything on the molecular scale is going to be far more complex from the perspective of the macro scale than we are used to. That's just a property of emergent complexity when we're talking about any macromolecular structure. Uh, Mr. Nelson, I think if all of them follow a moth template, you might want to consider the possibility that maybe they were all designed by the same guy. His name is God. There is no such possibility to consider. We have a mechanism that we know actually works to produce this sort of variation, and we have every type of evidence necessary to prove that it did. But you want me to make believe impossible absurdities for no good reason, and then to lie to students about that rather than tell them what we know to be really true. I can't do that, because unlike you, I have to be honest. Since each one is phenomenally complex, way more complex, a butterfly is more complex than the space shuttle. A 
A butterfly is more complex than the entire New York City. That's a bad example. Uh, it's something more organized, okay? The argument from complexity is actually an argument against God. Because gods and magic are the simplest and most infantile excuses men have ever made up to explain the things that they did not understand. Once upon a time, our ancestors believed that thunder, lightning, and volcanoes were gods in action, that comets were an omen, that the stars and planets had human characteristics, that sickness was a curse of witchcraft, and that epilepsy was demonic possession. All because that's what religion would have us believe. In each case, the real truth might never have been discovered if we'd been satisfied by those lies. And in each case, the reality was a revelation of whole new fields of study previously unimagined and vastly more complex than the simple excuses we made up in our superstitious ignorance. No doubt, that pattern will continue, such that if we ever do discover the cause of the Big Bang or some better explanation for the origin of life, the universe, and everything, it too will be a wealth of new information with practical application and so advanced that it will render our previous belief in gods, ghosts, and magic just as laughably silly as every other body of knowledge so far has already shown. Here we go. Let's finish up here. And then, of course, we have genetic sequencing to determine their familial relationship. So you have genetic sequencing to determine that they are related. Again, I would point out, if there's genetic sequencing that is similar, that doesn't prove a relationship. How many lines of code are there in Microsoft Word that are identical to the lines of code in Microsoft PowerPoint? Hundreds of thousands of identical lines of code. That doesn't prove a common ancestor. Why can't you guys see that? Ask yourself that question. Why is it that engineers, whose job is designing things, often believe in a god, but biologists, including geneticists, overwhelmingly don't? You can only vaguely understand the concept of genetics through analogy, and that analogy breaks down as soon as you try to apply it. Because it is not at all like a computer code. It's a series of chemical reactions. And the genome provides a number of different types of clues that no programmer would include and that don't function like a computer code and definitely do indicate phylogeny just as surely as a DNA test can prove paternity. And that's why, in the rare case that a biologist does believe in God, he still accepts evolution because he knows how to prove it. I mean, if you got to believe in a God, you can accept everything we know to be true about evolution and the Big Bang and anything else and still prop a God behind it somehow. You don't have to lie about science and deny reality to do that. I know you want very badly to be related to the apes, I understand, but that it's not true, okay? Certainly not science. I can prove that it is true and that it is certainly science. You don't understand that because I doubt you've ever understood anything. It has nothing to do with what I want. It's what I can show to be true without faith, even if I'd rather not believe it. Because if I could just deny evident reality and make believe any fantasy I like like you do, I wouldn't believe what I do. I wouldn't believe what you do either, because that's crazy. I'd rather be a Jedi and be reincarnated a thousand times, all while gaining levels of wisdom and experience. That's how it is in every universe that was ever intelligently designed in which magic really worked. As this article explains, that's easier than it used to be, because we can get reliable data sets in mere months, but it can take years to train researchers to be proficient in morphological character analysis. So we can, get the, we can get the data in months, but it takes years to train them. Let me interpret that. To train them to believe in evolution and to learn if they publish anything that goes against evolution, they will lose their job. That's what it takes years to teach them how to do. Yeah, think about that. Okay. No, that's just more paranoid conspiracy crap. To prove it, I challenge you to provide an example of the very best evidence you can think of against evolution. What would someone publish to peer review if they didn't accept evolution? What would they publish that promotes creationism instead? Show me that, and I will show you how it is false, fallacious, and proves that you don't even know what you're talking about. Show me the best you've got, because everyone watching this already knows I've been debunking your arguments for decades. I've already seen the best you've got, and you ain't got squat. And I think you know it, too. Broccoli is a human invention. Expl Broccoli is a human invention. You have <laughs> got to be kidding. <laughs> think about that just for a couple minutes. Broccoli is not a human invention. Let me explain this to you. Okay. Broccoli is a human invention. When I was doing my series, which I will continue if I get time, I went through the A's and said, how could this possibly evolve? And I went through the B's, one of which I mentioned was broccoli. 
Broccoli is not a human invention. Let me explain it to you carefully, Mr. Nelson. Broccoli is one of many different plants that has been derived from the wild mustard plant. They say there must be the same biblical kind. I believe they're probably the same kind of plant. Certainly they're a plant, okay? They're not a whale, they're not a bird, it's a plant. What they did, they took the wild mustard plant and selectively bred to get more larger terminal buds and they ended up with cabbage. Then they, somebody else said, no, I want more stems and flowers. So they kept breeding and breeding and crossbreeding and selecting for flowers and stems and they ended up with broccoli. See, humans did not invent broccoli, Mr. Nelson. They selected an already existing slice of gene code from a plant. They started with a plant, they ended up with a plant. But they selected, just like people selected dogs to get the smaller and smaller and smaller ones till you get one like beans that's completely useless, okay? And, but friendly, okay? So what happened over, over the decades and maybe even centuries, people selected a particular trait to get either, they, here, they selected for more, the stem or the leaf or the flower buds or the lateral leaf or the terminal bud or the flower bud and they've ended up with all these plants, and I don't think anybody disagrees, they all came from a common ancestor. Humans did not create broccoli. <sighs> broccoli is not a human invention. Humans selected a small slice of an already existing gene code. You see, the, bro the original plant already had leaves. They selected it to get more leaves. Oh, okay or they already had little stems or buds or whatever it was, they can select for more and more of one of those. But the further they get away from the normal wild mustard plant, the more problems you have. Each one of these plants, cabbage, Brussels sprout, kale, all of them, has to be, you have to babysit it. They plant them in the field. In the wild, they wouldn't survive very long. They would go back to their wild original one because they've selected one trait that they wanted, but it's now weaker. And they didn't add any genetic information at all. They selected a slice of already existing information. They, you, you could select for bigger dogs or smaller dogs, but you cannot put wings on the dog. It's not in the gene code to have a dog fly, okay? There are horse flies, but that's very different. You cannot get a dog fly. I've never heard of a dog fly. So, they did not, humans did not invent or create broccoli. How could you study biology at the University of Texas and not know this? Humans, some teacher lied to you. You should go back and get your money back. No, you lied to me. Whatever people derive through artificial selection becomes a human invention, as you can see. That's just the term that they use to describe human-derived breeds in agriculture. But your challenge to me was... I've been asking here, can you show me the evidence for how any of these things evolved? Where, not a line on paper, where's the evidence? How did we get butterflies from nothing? How did we get broccoli from nothing? So now I've shown the evidence that butterflies evolved, but not from nothing. They evolved from moths. And you showed the evidence that we didn't get broccoli from nothing either. You said no one could explain how broccoli evolved, but then you explained it yourself. So you knew there was an explanation when you said there wasn't one. How did you not know this already? I did know that already. You're the one who didn't know that, okay? How did you not know that already? Gee. You think this is inexplicable? Hey, where's that sand thing that makes the different... Uh... Who's got playing with There we go. Here. Mr. Nelson, you need to see and play with this for a while to understand ge geology. And you need to look at this once in a while to understand who doesn't understand, okay? <laughs> what would it take to get you to admit this mistake? What would it take to get me to admit this mistake? First of all, it's not a mistake. What would, what's it going to take to get you to admit your mistake, Mr. Nelson? Obviously, you are the one who made the mistake and who is now moving the goalposts, which is another logical fallacy. 
you're berating me for knowing what you hoped I wouldn't know, what I'd have to be stupid not to know, and now you can only pretend that I didn't know it and lie about it, hoping your sycophants don't realize what just happened here. Your followers may not see it, but everyone else watching this does. And hopefully, with your long string of failures so far in this debate, with all your battleships sunk but without scoring a single point against me yet, maybe you won't underestimate me again, though it's obviously too late now. Not true either. You have to justify your position. I have to justify my position. I'm not forcing everybody to pay for my position to be taught. You evolutionists are the guys that have to justify your position. Don't put the burden of proof on me. If I was requiring everybody to teach my religion, then yeah, the burden of proof would be on me. I'm not doing that. But you did. By your own admission, you were teaching in all those Christian schools without meeting any burden of proof, and nothing you told your students about evolution was true. And this is important because those students did not have a choice as to what kind of indoctrination they were going to be told. They went for an education expecting to be told the truth, and you didn't provide that. And for that reason, a lot of those students you taught are atheists now. Now, sadly, you think that anything that science can't explain is somehow explained by your God's magic? That's well, this is called a logical fallacy, Mr. Nelson. You give two options, neither of which is correct necessarily. A logical fallacy. You're good about pointing those things out. That's like me saying, are elephants pink or orange? How about, how, how, how about neither one? Maybe there's a third option. It, logical fallacy. If science can't explain it, therefore God did it with magic. That's the two choices you give. Well, there's a third choice. Science hasn't understood it yet. We're still studying it. Look, look, I love science. And there are scientific explanations for all sorts of things. It's not magic that these molecules are held together to make this glass. And water is not magic. Okay? It's got an ionic bonding, hydrogen, hydrogen oxygen molecules bonded together, 105 degree angle. And the, if it wasn't 105 degrees, if it was 180, like you would think it would, since you know, likes repel, except in San Francisco, or attract. So uh, if you made it where the oxygen molecule, the water molecule was oxygen and two hydrogens, it would line up and freeze solid, and ice wouldn't float. Lakes would freeze from the bottom up, and everything would die. But because of that 105 degree angle, as, ice, as water freezes into ice, it expands 12%, and ice floats. Almost all other liquids shrink when they freeze. Water doesn't. Who designed that? That is the fallacy of presupposition, where you presuppose a magical designer, because your god is magic. You just don't understand what magic is. If you compare and combine a collection of definitive sources, you'll see that the words magic and miracle share essentially the same definition, being the evocation of supernatural forces or entities to control or forecast natural events in ways which are inexplicable by science because they defy the laws of physics, making them physically impossible. And that's why your sacred fables are full of supernatural things traditionally described as magical. Curses, enchantments, potions, incantations, necromancy, golem spell, transformation, exorcism, purification, weather control, ghosts, demons, angels, fire breathing, dragons, faith healing, forecasting, and even water bending. Curses and blessings are positive or negative versions of magical enchantments. So whenever you tell someone to have a blessed day, I hear you saying to have a magically enchanted day. That is exactly how silly it sounds whenever you believers say that. You don't even know what you're saying. I don't have a problem saying, praise God for water and ice. God, you're smart. See, my knees bow to him right now. Yours will. I cannot bow to a figment of your imagination. And the reason that you have to give me this threat that it's going to happen after I die is because there's no chance in hell, literally, that it's going to happen while we're alive. Why? Because it isn't real. You also mentioned bears, which are closely related to both dogs and seals. Slow down. Slow down. <laughs> Bears. Bears are closely related to dogs and seals. Well, here we go, right here. Slide number 96. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, <laughs> did your parents have any children that lived? Okay. Um, 
Bears and seals and dogs are related. Let's see. Let me explain it to you. Let, let, let me, uh, quiet so you can get this now. Okay, pay attention. This is a seal. This is a bear, okay? This is a bear and these are seals. This is a wolf. This is a Boston Terrier. In fact, these are all the same species. There's more differences between dogs and dogs than there are differences between dogs and bears. So what is your problem with that? What is the difference between a dog and a bear? Start with Amphicyon, the fossil bear dog, or Hesperocyon, the undifferentiated dog-bear transition. In either case, if it loses the long tail, it becomes a bear. Or you could keep the tail and let it run digigrade up on its toes, becoming a dog, instead of plantigrade plodding about on its whole foot like bears do. When the difference is this slight, so slight that a single change makes it one or the other, then what objection could you possibly have that is based on reason? What reason can you give me why you deny this? Okay. The Bible says clearly that God made everything. God's claiming he made it all. But in Romans chapter 1, it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Mr. Nelson, you know full well there's a God and he made it. Aw, look at that. You're dabbling at presuppositionalism, just like your son. Don't. You'll hurt yourself. First off, even if we pretend that the Bible is the authority you imagine it to be, Romans 1.20 didn't apply to everyone in the world. They were directed only to a particular subset of Jews and Gentiles who were quarreling over who knew God better. Secondly, the passage actually requires that the reader simply assume the conclusion that creation requires a creator. But that's the fallacy of question begging. What if we call it reality instead? Does reality require a realtor? Otherwise, the passage gives no explanation as to how anyone, much less everyone, is supposed to know God, or that knows that God exists. There are also many other verses which prove that this cannot be the correct interpretation, beginning with the 16th verse of this very chapter from Romans, where it says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, which obviously implies that there are also those who do not believe. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 says the same thing. 1 Thessalonians 4.5 says the Gentiles don't know God. According to 1 Samuel 3.7, Samuel didn't know God. And Exodus 5.2 says Pharaoh didn't either. Jeremiah 9.3 has God himself complaining about people who don't know him. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 through 7 also states unambiguously that there are people who don't know that there is a creator God, much less who he is. So the Bible clearly admits in several places that there are people who do not believe in the God of Abraham, either because they believe in other gods instead or because they believe in no gods at all. Don't waste your time on presuppositionalism. It is the last-ditch apologetics for those who don't know anything except that they've already lost the argument. And you want to believe that bears and seals and dogs are related. For heaven's sake, you need a little, a little more education. I tell you what, we could start a college right here, Kent Hovind University. Come on down. I'll teach you a couple things, okay? The Bible says they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. So God gave them up. You know, God gives up on people. Kind of like you knock on somebody's door and they don't answer, so you give up and you go to the next door. Well, that proves that God doesn't know everything and that he can't foresee events to come. You really ought to pull your head out and think more about these fables you worship. We have fossil transitions of bears becoming seals, you said. Now slow down. Stop with the raw rat run and think about it for a minute, okay? Bears, polar bears, brown bears, black bears, American black bear, have 74 chromosomes. I suspect they had a common ancestor. A guinea pig. A guinea pig, that's right. Now, broccoli, they all came from broccoli. Anybody can't see the similarity. They're all green except for the bears. Hello, okay, now... How many chromosomes do seals have? Well, let's see, 32. Well, let me see if I got this right. Bears have 74, seals have 32. Explain where this extra information is coming from. 
So you think that more chromosomes equals more information? That it takes more information to make a grain of rice, an amoeba, or a butterfly than it does a human? Is that how you're measuring information? By the number of chromosomes? Steve, you've been working on computers for a long time. Do any computer programs automatically gain new information? I mean, like whole new millions of lines of code all of a sudden shows up. So you're typing away in, you know, Microsoft Word, and up comes all the instructions to build an airplane. And the, and it's not in the code, okay? 32 is different than 74, Mr. Nelson. I also taught mathematics, algebra, geometry, trig. If you want to have a quiz on those, I can help you. You're obviously unaware of how often even observed speciation events involve a chromosomal variance. The peripatric speciation of the Mycemagera is a good example of that, where one original species, isolated on an island by human sailors, soon became six species with chromosomes ranging from 22 to 30. This just in the last few hundred years. 30 is different from 22, but we know how this happens even in observed speciation events, so your objection is invalid. Now, dogs have 78. So bears have 74, seals have 32, dogs have 78. You want to think they're related, you're welcome to believe anything you want to believe. But that's not common sense. It's certainly not science. It is common sense science, since I provided the peer-reviewed laboratory evidence which you completely ignored. You said we have evidence showing their divergence in the fossil record. Let me point out something that I think should be obvious. Fossils don't talk, they don't have a date on them, they don't come with an instruction manual. You dig up a bone in the dirt and you put your interpretation on that. Secondly, I'd like to point out the obvious. Fossils, you can't prove they had any children. You certainly couldn't prove they had different children. Why is it no bear today is capable of producing anything other than a bear? And no seal is capable of producing anything other than a seal. But you think a bone in the dirt could do something that no bear or seal today could do. You have incredible faith. I greatly admire your evolutionist faith. I do not admire your intelligence, but I do admire your faith. I can't respect your intelligence either since you still can't understand any explanation of evolution even after I provide documentation that I'm right and you're wrong and that evolution is about populations, not individuals. That's incredible. And then you had the gumption <clears throat> to say, none of these things came from nothing. Hold on, that is exactly what you believe. I've been saying this over and over 62 times now. And you've never gotten it right, even once. A dot of nothing exploded and became everything, which would include the bear and the seal and the dog. I'm sorry, it wasn't an explosion, my mistake. It was a rapid expansion. And the stars are not getting farther apart, one guy told me. The distance between them is increasing. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. <laughs> I'm serious. You remember that? <laughs> he really did misunderstand that. He was trying to tell you that space itself is expanding. I'm not at all surprised that you didn't understand that. There are much easier concepts than that which you still can't comprehend. Uh, people with normal intelligence have trouble with this one. But that still leaves the genetic paternity test proving a familial relationship between dogs, bears, and seals, which you can neither account for nor honestly dismiss. The most important info that few people know the universe is 13.798 and what, 11 weeks old. That was 11 weeks ago they told me this. Okay. It is a sphere with a calculated diameter of 93 billion light years. Well, then, if it's only 13 or 14 billion years old, how did it get 93 billion light years across? Did the stars move faster than the speed of light? If you don't even understand evolution yet, don't try to level up to cosmology because that's hard even for me. But I can tell you that what cosmologists are saying is that space can expand faster than the speed of light. Genome sequence, comparative analysis, and how... You have genome sequence, okay. Well, what about the chromosome difference? Now, he's going to state here in a minute that we can prove cats and dogs, but he uses, of course, the big word for it. ...type structure of the domestic dog, which links them not just to other breeds of dogs, but to other species of dogs that can't... Wow. We can, we can link them to other species of dogs. See, he's stuck on this word species. That's what Charles Darwin was. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. Charlie Darwin wrote the book over there called The Origin of 
species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored life. Uh, races. Favored races uh, in the struggle for life. Okay. They're still the same kind. It's called a dog. And then you think that's evidence dogs and cats are related. Cats have retractable claws. Dogs don't. Where do those extra muscles come from? The ancestors of dogs used to be arboreal and had retractable claws too. They lost them the same way cheetahs did sometime after they became speed and distance predators. This same genetic study also links dogs to bears as well as seals. If you're doing a genetic study to link the dogs and bears and seals, explain the chromosome number difference. They're vastly different. Either two chromosomes fuse together or can be torn apart by centromeres pulling on the kinetic core in opposite directions. It's not that hard to understand and both have been documented. And you already accept this because you think that butterflies are all the same kind and have a common ancestor, even though you also said, I found the best article yet in Nature, which is a very famous science magazine. It says there's one group of butterflies where the number of chromosomes is different. It varies from 20 to 268. So the chromosome number difference isn't a problem if it's something you accept, but if it goes beyond that, then you employ another logical fallacy called the double standard. But, you know, being unable to win or concede any point, honestly, what else can you do? And then we have additional genetic evidence in a molecular phylogeny of the carnivora linking all conoidia and phylloidia. Whoa, they're all linked. You're not going to believe this now. They drew lines on paper. They shouldn't believe you because it's a lie. Genomic sequence comparisons are real, not something we just drew up. But you and I both know that you cannot defend creationism honestly. You have to lie about it, not just because there's no truth to it, which there isn't, but also because the truth is on my side and you have to keep the faith, which means you can't admit any of the evidence I present, no matter how compelling or conclusive it is, because faith is the most dishonest position it is possible to have. So none of these things came from nothing. Multiple lines of evidence indicate that they all came from prior forms. I agree they all came from prior forms. I agree the dogs came from prior forms of dog. I think the dogs you see today probably had parents that were dogs and grandparents that were dogs and probably great-grandparents that were dogs. They come from a long line of dogs, okay? And the bears come from a long line of bears. That's where it stops. There's, you dream this SpongeBob imagination stuff, fairy tale. Oh, just think about it. If you go back millions of years, can't you see the similarity between a seal and a dog? No. Then, without your usual excuse of pretending that nothing means anything, how do you explain the fossil bear dogs and dog bears and even bear seals that I mentioned? Because so far, all your counter arguments have been limited to ear plugging denial. No, -uh, that didn't mean anything. That didn't prove anything. Fake news. And then you pretend that that even after all these years, if you still don't understand anything that the theory teaches, it's because the theory is stupid rather than the dotard who after all this time still can't figure out the basics of what evolution even is, much less how it works.